Glad to see all of you again. We're getting close to the end of our study in the Sermon on the Mount, so I'm going to ask you to turn to uh, Matthew chapter 7. We're going to read uh, verses 13 through 23, but you'll, you're, you're going to find out that I'm going to spend the majority of the time on the first two bo- verses. They're, they're foundational to the, uh, the balance of the chapter and the, and the balance of the sermon. Uh, as we near the end, uh, we come to even more of these, I like to call them familiar verses, uh, the narrow gate and the wide Uh, These two trees, the good tree and the bad. Uh, Ultimately, the two houses with the two foundations. In each case, uh, there appear to be only two options. That's really important. Uh, Every illustration the Lord uses, there's only two options. And added to that, we'll come to see in these verses today an added intensity that you can feel in the words of our Lord. How solemn are the consequences of the decisions called for. In every instance, destruction, a fire, rejection, uh, finally this great fall of, of, the, of the house. Uh, years ago, there was an advertising jingle <clears throat> that was popular promoting a certain uh, soft drink. Uh, all the other soft drinks were Im- imposters, so the ad ran. But Coca-Cola, well, it's the real thing. Uh, well, here in these final verses, Jesus demands a similar thing. He has in the sermon, if you'll allow me, just a very brief overview, insisted that there are uh, two kinds of righteousness, Uh, Two treasures to seek, two masters to serve, two ambitions to pursue. There are only two options, uh, only two. And now at last it is decision time. One doesn't have the option of neutrality. There are only two ways to follow, two trees to emulate, two claims that ultimately will be heard. And at the end, one house will stand firm and the other will suffer the greatest fall. In each case, to the earthbound eye, uh, the one option seems preferable to the other, but the opposite is the reality. Uh, This is more, though, than intellectual or philosophical debate. The stakes are the highest they could possibly be. Will those who hear his sermon wholeheartedly respond with commitment, or will their professed discipleship be an empty one? There can be no middle ground. Instead, one must choose, and Jesus encourages them to opt for the real thing, not the spurious. Well, he's just concluded, when we come to verse 13, he's just concluded his summary of the law and the prophets by offering his golden rule, treat others the way you would have them treat you. And now he calls for a decision, beginning with verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow, that leads to life, and there are few who find it. The directive is blunt. Jesus doesn't soften it with a soothing now, or a logical therefore, or a signal, let me summarize. The Greek language of the New Testament makes ready use of connectives like that. Uh, They're at his disposal, but here Jesus gets right to the critical point. You have a decision to make, he says. Here are two ways with two gates, and you must choose which one to travel. This really is the the Christian life, if you think about it, where the rubber meets the road. It is what a believer in Jesus Christ faces every day of his or her life. There is a broad way. Sometimes it appears everybody is on it, and there is a narrow way, and at times you feel you're the only one on it. 
But let's back up and examine these opening verses carefully. Notice the cluster of twos that the Lord identifies. There are two ways and there are two gates. There are two groups, the many and the few. And then there are two destinations, destruction and life. He starts with the most important thing. You must find the narrow gate. But he doesn't say why until the end. And in between is what inevitably distracts from finding that narrow gate. And that's indicated by the little connector word that he does use for. Enter the narrow gate because the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. The implication is that the decision of which gate to enter and which way to trod will not at all be without its challenges. For one thing, it does not appear that the narrow way is very popular. There are many on the broad way. It's filled with all sorts of people. It is, it is the effortless path upon which one may find himself almost unawares. Here I am. Uh, this is the way of the open-minded and all those who like to think of themselves as basically good people who are making their way through life as best as they can and convinced that the good things they have done generally outweigh the bad and they're magnanimous in allowing a broad spectrum of other people to join them on that way. Anyone who would suggest that they are headed down the wrong path uh, is simply judgmental and narrow-minded. But the overwhelming picture the Lord seems to be making is just how broad this way is. Uh, one has plenty of elbow room on the broad way. It is generous, we might say commodious. Uh, the traffic flows smoothly because everybody is traveling in the same direction. <clears throat> Therefore, it can be said to have within it many diverse lanes. It allows for many of what we may you know, indulgingly call truths. For after all, the open-minded uh, traveling upon this path are engagingly welcoming of all sorts of truths, seeing as how thoughtless as the idea may be, they all lead to the same place. But the point of the Lord's words is not really the wide gate and the broad way. The, those are but window dressing for the most important thing, which, as I said, is that he insists his disciples must choose. It's possible to mindlessly drift into the broad way, but no one drifts into the narrow way by chance. You cannot just drift into a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Don Carson, in his commentary on Matthew, uses an interesting illustration to describe this process of entering the narrow gate. He, he pictures two cones, and I invite you to picture these, these two cones. A, a, picture a megaphone, if, if you will. Um, and one is a seemingly very large one, for it is approached at the wide end of the cone. And, and this is the broad way. It's, it's religion, perhaps even professing Christianity. And those who enter into it are allured by the language of life and forgiveness and joy, perhaps even uh, material prosperity. You know, this might be your best life now, coming in here to this broad end of the cone. But as they travel further in, they're confronted with the uncomfortable realities of sin and repentance and obedience and discipleship. And stumbling over this, they retreat and they, and they find an easier way to travel. But the cone may also face the other way, and so now we're to look at it in a different way. Turn that cone around to, to its smallest part. And now the entrance seems quite narrow. A person must enter it alone without bringing in the baggage he thinks will admit him. His good works and, and self-righteousness, the religious legacy perhaps of his upbringing, or even his worldly success, all that must be left behind. 
However, once in, he discovers to his delight these broad horizons of hope and glory and ever-increasing possibilities to experience. This is the approach to God that the apostles and the other New Testament writers described. No one could be declared righteous and gain entry into the family of God by any righteousness of their own. They could not bring that in with them. All that pretense must be left behind. You remember the Beatitudes. It's no accident. They begin with the blessing upon the poor in spirit. It is only those who understand their poverty of spirit, their own poverty of anything that would gain them admittance into God's favor who will enter the narrow gate. Now the way is narrow and restricted. It is only through Christ that one may enter. And the Lord said that to himself uh, in John chapter 10. Not only did he say that he was the good shepherd and the good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. He also said that he was the, the gate. He insisted he was the door into the sheepfold. And if anyone enters through him, that is through the door, he will be saved. And remember he said he'll go out and he'll find pasture. That's just it. That's what happens when you enter into the narrow gate. That's the broad end of the cone. But there is only the one way and only the one gate. That's why Jesus could say in another place, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father but through me. Well, you know all that. The translators, the interpreters struggle a little bit here with verse 14. I want you to look at it. The gate is small and the way is narrow. That's how my version translates it. The English Standard Version is different. It reads, the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. It's partly just the way we use language, syntax, trying to say what we mean in a manner that pleases the ear. If you teach or you speak and you go and you look at what you're going to say, you realize you keep saying the same word over and over again, so you pick some synonyms to mix it up a little bit. It's possible to translate words in different ways, obviously, but the Lord actually said something more along the lines of how the ESV translators decided. The word translated narrow in verse 13, enter through the narrow gate, is the same Greek word translated small in verse 14, stenes. But the word translated narrow in verse 14 is a different word than that translated narrow in verse 13. And so the ESV has it as hard. It's a word that means something like constricting or, or pressing to thlimine. It even sounds that way, doesn't it? It's, it's barging in on either side of you to thlimine. So when we're faced with this decision, the Lord demands, and we desire to opt for life and and not for destruction, we find the way pressing in upon us on, on either side. It becomes very narrow and not wide at all. This may explain why the topic of lordship salvation often vexes us the way it does. On the one hand, Jesus is emphasizing to prospective disciples the importance of counting the cost of, of following him. He, he would say things like this. This is Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That sounds quite restrictive. It, it sounds hard. Yet on the other hand, the Lord could portray his offer of salvation in the most tender and, and broad way terms. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. Uh, My burden is light. Well, we must accept and believe both. Jesus did. He, He told his disciples, 
There is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age and in the age to come eternal life. This is the irony. The way to life is confining and hard, and we must not deny it, yet Jesus promised glory and abundant life for all those who choose it. Things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered into the heart of man. All that God has prepared for those who love him. The gate is narrow and the way is hard. The promises for those who choose that path beyond imagination. So the narrow way is clearly marked, not some undefined direction. As we said, one does not simply drift into it. Its boundaries do not come up for review uh, according to passing fancy. Consequently, those who choose it and accept it as such are often viewed as intolerant. But tolerance that harms and follows ignorance is not a virtue, and the embrace of absolute truth that brings us to God is the greatest gift, which is how the Word of God describes it. It is the free gift of God, brought about by the sovereign, uh, regenerating power of God to remove the scales of unbelief and give eyes to see the marked, narrow way. When we pray for the lost, when we pray for family, when we pray for friends, what do we pray for? We pray that the Lord will regenerate them and give them new birth so that they might be able to believe and go down that narrow way. Because we know inability. We were taught that last week. So there are two ways and two gates. In the same vein, the Lord describes two groups of people who choose there are the many and there are the few. Uh, the way is broad that leads to destruction, the Lord states here, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. What is the Lord saying here? Is God chintzy with his grace? Will heaven be a kind of holy fraternity, a kind of exclusive club consisting only of the privileged chosen who have navigated the proper path there as, as God has called them out, rushed them, we might say, and escorted them along the passage to his celestial home? And yet in the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation, we're furnished with a snapshot of the future in which John looks and beholds this great multitude, which no one could even count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, crying out with loud voices, salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That doesn't sound like few. That sounds like many. B.B. Warfield, the great Princeton seminary professor, actually wrote an essay addressing the topic entitled, Are They Few That Be Saved? I recommend that article uh, to you. But without going into his arguments in detail, suffice it to say, Warfield concluded that the number of the redeemed saved for eternity will be vast and immeasurable. Warfield obviously does not ignore our Lord's words here. He doesn't just toss those aside. After all, it is Jesus who said to the crowd, the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. In fact, in another place, in Luke chapter 13, some unknown person listening to Jesus teach asked him straightforwardly, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? Can't you imagine someone as asking that question? I, that's a question I would ask. Lord, are there just a few that are being saved? And Jesus, if, if you go back there in Luke 13, Jesus really declined to directly answer that question, instead responding in the same spirit as we have here in his sermon. He said, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. 
And so what the Lord appears to have been emphasizing in both of these pa passages is what Warfield phrase, and hear this, he called it an ethical concern and not a prophetic one. He's directing his words, his warning really, to every individual who would consider these two ways, knowing Jesus, knowing that the circumstances would be such that they must make their decision against the tide of the majority. Now that we can relate to, right? When that decision is being made, the Holy Spirit is moving. Normally it's against the tide of the majority. Their decision will not be a majority decision. Ultimately, every individual will make his or her decision alone. But upon that moment of grace, when a person believes the gospel and places his trust in Christ, he is united with him and is indwelt by his spirit and made a member of the body of Christ and joined as brother and, or sister to the great multitudes have, who have been forgiven and saved and given an inheritance with the Lord Jesus Christ. And all others, uh, the many of Jesus' plea here, may think they have found the way or that they will find the way or in the end will be forgiven despite their not traveling the narrow way, but their co contentment will prove delusional. Uh, they may call themselves Christian, but they are cut flower Christians, that's an expression I heard this week. They, they are cut flower Christians. Like a cut flower, they have no connection to the source that gives them life. And their pretense to be a flower, a Christian, soon withers. And what do we do with those? We, we, we throw them out, if it's the right week, on the sidewalk. And so we observe in Jesus' words, not only that there are two ways and two gates and two groups of people, but most importantly, there are two destinations. The way is broad that leads to destruction, Jesus says. The way is narrow that leads to life. The end is the thing. Here is the eternal perspective that imbued the writings of the New Testament authors and his been the theme of all the great saints of old. This life is not all there is, and the decisions we make in the present do not find their ends merely in the here and now. The significance of the path is wrapped up in its destination. That was the lesson learned by the psalmist in Psalm 73. I like using that illustration because I know you all know Psalm 73. Uh, this psalmist was on one path, the wicked were on a completely different path, and as he gazed upon them, he saw only the present, while his own life was beset by trials, theirs boasted riches and power and pride. It was a snapshot, but it didn't tell the whole tale. That's what you and I often see, uh, the unbelieving neighbor. The, the scoffing co-worker, the recalcitrant relative, uh, the masses at their Sunday morning brunches, enjoying the fruit, they're there now, enjoying the fruit of their tireless labor or their privileged position in life. They give no thought to the end of it all. I'm not trying to criticize those people. Uh, there, it's by the grace of God that we're seated here this morning. But they're there. And they, they are not thinking of the end of it all. It was troublesome to the psalmist, you remember, until he saw their end. He came into the sanctuary of God and he saw their end. Surely, your Lord, you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. And there's that word. You cast them down to destruction. The way leads to destruction. It's an interesting, if not, if, 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 if frightening word, apoleos. 
It's semantically tied to a similar word you're very familiar with because it's found in the best known verse in the Bible. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, and whosoever should believe in him should not perish. There it is. Apolumi. Apoleus, Apolumi, should not perish, but have everlasting life. What a tragedy that there, what a tragedy that there are so many traveling along the wide and broad road with all its freedoms and with all its good company, all the while giving little thought to their destination. Only the narrow path leads to life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And while we travel the narrow way, we are living the life that Christ has gained for us, has gifted us. We are alive in him, and we can and should rejoice in that life. But this, this is something for us to never forget. One day the promise will be realized fully. While we trod this earthly, narrow path, it may appear at times to pale in comparison with life on that broad path. But at death, and I borrowed this phrase from another, but at death we will explode into life, into the vitality of Christ and the consummation of our earthly sojourn with him. We've had some very dear friends reached that destination recently. From one perspective, they've died. But from the only perspective that counts, the one coming from Jesus who said the way is narrow that leads to life, our friends have been blasted into the kingdom of God and the joyful presence of their Savior. That's called glory. And I would just say to those who perhaps have not yet entered at that narrow gate, you have a decision to make. There are only two ways. One leads to destruction, the other to life. There's no neutrality. This isn't Switzerland. There's no neutrality on the matter. With the fervency of urgency, Jesus Christ calls for a decision. Well, I've spent the majority of our time on those first two verses because they set the stage for what follows. And beginning in verse 15, now, the Lord addresses himself to dangerous people who make the decision confusing and might lead one to choose the wrong way. Verse 15, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. I want you to think when you see beware of the false prophets, think of teachers, think of leaders, think not just of prophets, but people who make a claim to speak in some way for God. Beware of the false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles are they. So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Fire is always a, 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 a word that symbolizes judgment. So they're, they're, it's, it's cut down and it's thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Well, obviously, this is a quite serious warning. Uh, it is one most of us are familiar with. We hear it from this pulpit. Uh, month after month, year after year, I look out and I see so many who have been here for so long. You, you know this. We hear it all the time. Dr. Johnson, Dan, whoever's in that pulpit, they're, they're, they're saying, watch out for these people. We follow the example of the Apostle Paul, who in that moving passage in Acts 20 met with the elders of the church church 
in Ephesus and he instructed them to be on guard both for themselves and for the flock of God, knowing that after Paul departed, savage wolves would come in and not sparing the flock and from among their own men would arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. It's quite possible that Paul then was thinking of Jesus' words here. Uh, the figure is the same. They're ravenous wolves that come to the church in the guise of harmless sheep. That means they're first of all deceptive. They're deceptive. They act as though they are simply one of the sheep. They're right in here locked arms uh, with us. But since they are some kind of a leader, an elder perhaps, or a popular teacher, or a charismatic organizer, they must be slightly better in some ways than others, and they're to be trusted. And sadly, in that deception, they're, they're also dangerous. They are savage, ravenous wolves that threaten the, the sheep. They will leave behind carnage. That's an ugly scene to be out in the field and, and see the animal torn to pieces by a coyote or we don't have wolves here, but the figure is the same. And all the more so since they enter the church as one of the sheep and they're thus usually accepted as such and, and quickly gather a following within. That makes them especially dangerous and therefore the church should beware of them and, and not be dazzled by their uniqueness or naively attracted to traits that on the surface may make them compelling. What then must we do as a church when it's so difficult to discern between the, the real and the false? You can't guard against what you can't see. Well, here our Lord lays down the rule by which we are to judge of them, and he does it by mixing his metaphors a bit. That's okay. Switching from sheep and wolves to trees and their fruit. And here's how we'll know the difference. You will know them by their fruits. He says it two times for emphasis in verse 16 and again in, in verse 20. In between, he, he specifies the difference between grapes and thorn bushes and between figs and, and thistles. We don't have to be acquainted with horticulture at the time, whatever he was referring to. We get it. The issue is what do they produce? The quality of the fruit they produce will infallibly mark the quality of the tree itself. Now what kind of fruit are we talking about here? Uh, what, what should we be looking for? Well, let's consider, we, have, we must consider the context, which we know is the true way to life and salvation and not the false way, so we first think of doctrine. Paul warned in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 through 15, of false apostles and deceitful workers who disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. He said, don't be surprised when that happens, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Does this wolf in sheep's clothing hold to and teach the same narrow gate and hard way that Jesus proclaimed? Or does he blur the distinction between the narrow way and the broad way? In another place, the Apostle John, this is 1 John, a verse in chapter 2, a verse in chapter 4. He said basically the same thing. He spoke against those who would deceive the church in chapter 2 and then in chapter 4, he instructed the believers to not believe every spirit, but test the, the spirits to see whether they are from God. We should be humble, but nevertheless diligent, fruit testers. Someone taught me a long time ago how to pick out a good avocado from a, a bad one. You don't just go grab three or four avocados, throw them in the bag, and check out, check out, go make good guacamole. That's my one nod to Super Bowl Sunday. <laughs> guacamole. You have to test them. You have to prove them up. 
But there are other ways to test the spirit of a man or woman. Does their fruit yield honor and glory to Christ and and not to man? Is the fruit of their teaching and leading growing Christians? Or is it worldly Christians pursuing worldly things? Are the leaders themselves worldly and sensual? Or are they characterized by the fruit of the Spirit? This is not to say we should be judgmental. We were reminded of that in previous verses in the sermon, not judgmental. It doesn't mean we should be heresy hunters, obsessed with finding a wolf in every new person that walks through our door. But Jesus does instruct us to beware. Hold on to it. Pay close attention. That's what the word means. We must identify them when they come in among us as quickly as possible or their rottenness will spread and contaminate the rest of us. It's a disturbing image that the Lord paints. Look at verse 18. Now, this is a spiritual law of, of, of sorts involving inability. If it is a good tree, it cannot produce bad fruit. Likewise, if it's a bad tree, it cannot cannot produce good fruit. And such a tree as that, the Lord concludes in verse 19, will soon meet its fate. Such trees serve no good function, and a good arborist will see to it that it's removed. There will be certain judgment upon such as those. Our passage today ends with another two, the two claims. Verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in the heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast, our, cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So just as there are true leaders in the church and false leaders, so there are true professors of faith in Christ and false. This is treacherous ground for a teacher. No teacher wishes to encourage uncertainty to a professing believer who even now is struggling with assurance. But the scriptures teach, and this is one more example, that the proof is in the pudding. The proof is in the pudding. There is a special danger in mere verbal profession of faith in Christ that does not inevitably uh, result in obedience some form of obedience. Jesus speaks of that day. That is the day when the kingdom comes and and secrets are revealed. My secrets, your secrets. The day when everyone will stand before the judgment seat of God. The the tares and the wheat will be separated. The sheep from the goats. And as the Lord promises here, many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not make like Christians? During our earthly existence, did did we not have good intentions? Did we not go to church and give to the church? Maybe give quite generously to the church and live a generally upright life, as we like to say. I haven't killed anybody, you know, as the world might imagine an upright life to be. But all along, they were on the broad way that leads to destruction. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, the Lord says, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. What is it to do the will of the Father? Is it the self-perception and the self-righteousness that persuades a person he is safe? No. It is throwing oneself completely upon the saving grace of God in Christ, confessing our spiritual poverty and trusting only in Him for forgiveness and life, trusting in the atoning work of Christ alone. For it is by grace we have been saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, 
for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works that we should walk in them. It's all of grace. <clears throat> it's the narrow gate and the hard way that leads to life. Few comparatively may find it, but God in grace will irresistibly draw to Himself those, and He will say with the Apostle, that we are confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in us will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. All other confidences are imposters. Jesus is the ultimate real thing, and he calls all to decide on him. The testimony of all who do is he will not disappoint faithful Savior, sustainer, and friend, majestic, just, sovereign God. That's why we're here, to worship Him. What a privilege. Let's give thanks and praise. Lord, we do praise You. What a magnificent Savior You are uh, to think of what we deserve, to think of how lost uh, we would be uh, trotting this path and that path, going down this philosophy and then this other one, and yet you grabbed hold of us and you gave us a new uh, birth. You gave us the gift of faith. You pointed us to Christ and you enabled us to believe in him and find ourselves with this open spectrum of glory and a bright future and true life. We're so thankful. May we live lives that reflect that uh, with grateful hearts. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.